mighty heaven. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise his unequaled greatness. Praise him with the blast of the horn. Praise him with the lyre and the harp. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with the clash of cymbals and praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we are in the midst of summer. Yeah, the heat is on. I don't know if you guys have felt it. Anybody notice that this week? It was kind of hot. How many of you were hiding out inside this week because it was just too hot? Yeah, there were moments where I thought, what was I doing outside? We took the teenagers paintballing, and uh, it was hot while we waited, but boy, we forgot about the heat because uh, after a while, all we were concerned about was getting shot, all right? But it was a lot of fun, been a busy week, and uh, you know that was with the teenagers on Wednesday, and then Thursday, the kids... Uh, we gathered them here for gid- gadgets and gizmos. I always want to say gadgets and gazmos. I don't know why, but that's what I want to say. And uh, we, we're looking at how God made us in his image. And uh, it was really great to watch some of the kids draw a self-portrait of themselves on a mirror. Uh, that was kind of challenging. Could you, maybe you should just try that sometime. But, you know, this idea of God being creator and, and all that he's given to us is sometimes something that we neglect to really take in completely. We, tendency, we have a tendency to just to, you know, restrict God to the church box. But he's given us so much. He really has. And, and we're in the midst of a, a teaching series on stories of transformation, trying to understand uh, the way that God has put things in the Scripture to help us see transformation more clearly. And, and uh, I'm going to be uh, wrapping up my portion of that today. Next week we have a special guest preacher, someone who's never preached here before, although he's preached here before. Uh, we'll see how that works out. But he's never preached here before. And so what, I want you to come next week. And I want you to listen. I'm going to be here. All right. And I'm anxious to hear this preacher. Okay. I'm anxious to hear what it is that God has to say through this person. But in working through these stories of transformation, kind of where I'm at in this is that I looked at, at Stephen's life. And I share with you how I identified with this man named Stephen, who is found in the New Testament in the book of Acts. And how he started by just waiting on tables and caring for widows. And next thing you know, he was somebody out performing miracles and preaching the word of God. And then was martyred, killed because of his commitment and his testimony of faith. Um, and then last week, we took some time to look at, at Abraham and how in Abraham's story uh, that there is a lot of things that Abraham just does weird or wrong uh, that just don't make any sense to us when we think about it from a, well, this is, if you're going to make it to the, into the Bible Faith Hall of Fame, that you probably have your act together. And when you read through Abram's story, Abraham's story, you find out he's a long way from having his act together as he walks in his journey of faith. And that his entire life is a story of transformation. And so today I want to I take it and I want to look at a, a different angle. I don't want to look at just one person. I want to kind of challenge us as a whole. We're Father's Day, and I want to challenge us with a, an aspect of transformation that maybe you need to go through, just like I've had to go through this, and I continue to go through this aspect of transformation. And that is, that it, it, it seems like a, a rather simple thing, but it is a very deep thing. It seems like something that, you know, we could just easily take for granted. But the truth is, is that it's something that shapes so many other aspects of our Christian experience and our our transformation journey. And quite simply, what I want to look at is the transformation that you and I have as it relates to how we refer to God as Father. You see, we live in a culture filled with fathers. That's why we have Father's Day. Most of us, well, actually all of us, are here because of a father. He may not have stuck around. He may have been, you know, um, just on the move. But we're here because of a father. He, we, we may not even had a father who cared for us and nurtured us, protected us. It's quite possible some of you in this room had a father who abused you, neglected you, and took major advantage of you. It's quite possible that some of you in this room have have someone that you identify, yeah, that's my father in the sense that they are biologically true, but they didn't live up to it. 
in any fashion. And I want us to, to wrestle with this because at some level, I think all of our earthly fathers let us down. And all of our earthly fathers play a role in shaping the way we see God the Father. Every one of our earthly fathers shapes it, and there's no way we can get around it. And the reason is, is that we simply use the same word to describe both. Father. I mean, and it's hard when you use the, the same word to describe it. Risa had a little bit of a challenge explaining her story because she had two Davids in there. And for a moment, if you weren't paying close attention, you're like, wait a second, which David is that? Is that the older David or the younger David? And they both had similar traits. Both of them, heart disease. Both of them, alcoholics. And so, if we're not careful, we can mix, wait, 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 wait what were we talking about? And, and we can get it mixed up. And I'm not, I don't want to spend too much time there. But what I, want to, what I want to say is that when we use the word father to describe God, the way that we see our earthly father shapes that. And there's no way around it. So if your father was stern or detached or funny or gracious, those shape the way that you see God the Father. Chances are your father has at one point or another in your life scolded you. Now, that may have happened more often than what you wanted it to. It may have happened more often than it needed to. Maybe dad was having a bad day and you became the brunt of his bad day. Because sometimes that happens to us. Maybe your dad's like I can be sometimes to my kids or like my dad was to me in that he keeps things from you. He doesn't tell you everything that's going on all the time, all the way through. And it's kind of like, where are we going? We'll find out when we get there. It's like, really? Can't you just tell me? Well, when you need to know, I'll let you know. And if that's one of the ways that your dad was or is, then maybe you question whether or not you should ask God any questions. You see, all of us have been shaped by our fathers and the way that we see our Father in heaven. And even those of us who didn't grow up with a dad are shaped. Because without the Father there before you, there raises the question of, if I didn't have an earthly father to model before me, care for me, and take care of me, is there really a God? You see, we, we easily throw out God as Father. We pray it. We're taught to pray it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We start with our Father. And for many people, this is a barrier of faith for them. For many people, it's not necessarily a barrier, you know, to why it is they won't accept Jesus, but it becomes a barrier to why it is that they don't grow in their relationship with God. And so if you're a dad in this room, like I am, I just want to remind you of a couple things. One, we have a tough job. And our job is different than mom's job. Because when somebody makes it onto TV spontaneously, when have you ever heard somebody say, hi, dad? 90% of people, what do they say? Hi, mom. We have a tough job, dads, because the patterns that we live and the pace that we carry out shapes the way that our kids see God. And so we have to ask, you know, well, am I doing a good job? And if you're like me, you kind of go, well, I'm not sure. And so if you're kind of in that, no, I'm not sure category, let me just 
Let me encourage you. There's grace for you too. You don't have to get it right all the time, every time. You're gonna blow it. You're gonna miss it. You're not gonna be perfect. And your pursuit for perfection can actually distort your kid's perception of God. And so when you mess up, use those as moments to teach your kids that, hey, I blew it. You see, I think we all have to have this transformation talk about how it is that we see God as Father because we're all scarred by our fathers. And we come across passages like our Father who art in heaven, and we kind of go, well, I don't really like to play, pray that way, so can I just use God? Can I? And yes, you can. And so we struggle to call God Father. But then we, we read deeper in other passages in Scripture, and we get into to Romans chapter 8. And so open up your Bible there, and I want you to look at this passage here. And I want you to, to wrestle with what Paul is writing to the church at Rome at this point here. And, and I want you to kind of begin thinking about the dynamics of this. And he writes this, the same type of phrase in another section we'll look at in just a moment. And I want us to wrestle with how revolutionary this is and how much this shapes us and changes us. And then we're going to look back at Jesus and begin to understand what it is that we really need to envision when we think about the Father. But Romans chapter 8 Verse 15, this will be tough for some of us as we think about our relationship with our dad and our fathers. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Now just pause there for just a moment. Sometimes kids can feel that way in their own household. They can be afraid to miss it, afraid to mess up, afraid to ask, afraid. And that they're not supposed to ask questions and they're just supposed to do what has been told. Go change the television channel. Bring me the remote control. Eat your breakfast. Because as dads, sometimes we can be slave drivers. You have not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. Instead, you have see, received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And this is where it gets tricky. Now we call him Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in Christ's suffering. I want to focus in on this aspect of now we call him Abba Father. And this Abba Father that we're referencing here is not the 1970s band Abba. But it's the same word. And it's, it's different than just the word that's translated father because the word that's translated father is used a couple of different times in the Greek couple different places by the different authors, but the word Abba isn't used as frequently. It makes three appearances by my study. Two of them are by Paul and one is by Jesus, as recorded by Mark. And this notion of Abba, Father, it it, some have said that it's, it's a more intimate and a more juvenile way to refer to a dad. When I say juvenile, I don't mean like, you know, <clears throat> immature juvenile. I mean more like a kid's way of referring to their dad. And that's tough if you grew up with a bad dad. I've met people who refer to their dad by the dad's first name. I remember when I tried that once. <laughs> Didn't go over so well. Nah, one, one, so, but I mean, I've, I've met them. They, they, they refer, or they refer to him not even as dad or father, but the old man. 
the old man, the old man. And it, it, it's not a term of endearment or a term of respect or any of those, nat- those, those things that you'd want, those things that you kind of expect on Father's Day. It's filled with animosity, almost a grudge. And so if you were somebody who grew up with a very difficult relationship with your earthly father, then it's going to be really hard for you to be able to, to use a very affectionate term that is related to dad when you're talking about your heavenly father. And because of the way that you see your dad and not being able to kind of be affectionate with your dad, you're going to struggle with being affectionate with God. But it says that he's adopted us. Paul writes, he's, a, he's adopted you and, and, and he's taking you in. And, and this is different than, this is different than the way that sometimes we just grow up in a family. You know, the, the comedians have said, you know, I'm your father. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. And some of our dads have actually said that. And we're kind of like, yeah, okay. Do you love me? And you know, sometimes we know they're joking. And sometimes it wasn't so joking. But here's the difference. I want you to catch this. All right. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. It, you know, it can be one of those phrases that pushes us away versus a phrase which is, I chose you. You weren't just something I was stuck with. I selected you. I've embraced you. You're mine. I fought for you. I paid for you. There's a, there's a different level of action that's occurring. Sometimes dads get straddled with kids and they weren't prepared for it and they didn't know it was coming. They just were out trying to have a good time. And it's like, oh, got a kid out of that one. I I didn't choose that. I chose to have a good time. And that's where when Paul writes that we've been adopted, we need to catch this. God is choosing us. And this is the beginning of the transformation. This is the beginning of the shift. This is the beginning of the change. Because I think it's easy for us to say, well, you know, I know God's the creator and God, you know, he made everything. And, and, and in some sense, you know, Moses writes about that. You know, Moses in, in, uh, in chapter 32 of, of Deuteronomy is, is uh, speaking to them and he says, he says, quite simply, he says, hey, you know, isn't your, fa- isn't your father who, isn't he your father who created you? Has he not made you and established you? And so that created you and established you since sometimes we use that in, in, a, in, in a negative way. We see it in a negative way. He's like, yeah, well, if you hadn't made me, what would you do with me then? And we see God as creator and, and we know he made us and so he's got to like us, Right? He's got to love us because, well, he made us. We're his mess. The pottery barn. He broke us. He fixes us. But see, this is not what Paul is talking about. This is not the way that Paul's driving it. Paul turns it and shifts it and transforms our understanding, begins to transform the way that we see God. And that God is not just has to put up with us. God chooses us chases us, pursues us, pays for us, longs for us. As though he wants us. Dads, I'm speaking to me and I'm speaking to you. Do we always display I want my kids around? Maybe not. Maybe it's a place that we really need to think about that. 
Do we just put up with them? Ah, it's a tough thing to think about, dads. Being a dad is tough. I'm not sure I like the job title. I like my kids. I'm just not sure I like what I have to do as a dad. Because I gotta be engaged when I might choose to sit back. I have to express and do more than what I want to sometimes. I gotta lay down on the floor and play cars or Barbie dolls or whatever. I gotta read a story when I just wanna watch a television show. Got to chauffeur them from one place to the next when I'd rather just do what it is that I want to do. He gave us a spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. It's different. It's the spirit of adoption. It's the spirit of, you know, he chooses us. And most of us, we look to our dad when we think about God. But I want you to flip over to John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, Jesus is recorded having a conversation with his disciples. And it's, it's one that we've heard different elements of at different times, particularly we like to quote this at funeral time. John chapter 14, verse 1, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If there were not so, I would have told you and where I'm going, I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am and you will know where I am going. The disciples respond, no, we don't know where you're going, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so uh, can we know the way? Jesus replied, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me, and if you have really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do, not, you do know him and have seen him. Philip cries out, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus replied, you have been with me all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why do, I, why do you ask me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me and does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you've seen me do. Jesus goes on and he's got a lot of other things to say here. But too many of us look at our earthly dads and we say that's like what God is. And what I want to challenge you and what I want to help you begin the transformation in your life and the transformation of how you see God is I don't want you to look at just your earthly dad to form your image of God the Father. I want you to look first at Jesus and to look at Jesus as he's revealed as what we have to, shown to us through this gospel accounts. Not the way that you envision Jesus, cool hippie Jesus, or, you know, passive Jesus, or, you know, English, British accent Jesus. But I want you to look at what it is that Jesus does. How is it that he engages with people? And so when you see a blind man come to him and who's needing help, what does Jesus do? He helps. When you see 10 men with skin disease who are walking by and, and they're, they're, they're needing help, what does Jesus do? He heals them. Even when they're ungrateful, he heals them. When Jesus sees a father whose son is throwing himself into seizures and goes into a fire and, and can't seem to help himself and the dad is just exasperated at what to do and he's out of options, what is it that Jesus does? He listens to the father's complaint and then he heals the son. 
What does Jesus do with the woman who is rumored to be a sinner? Code word for sexual deviant. Likely a prostitute who does all sorts of nasty things. What does he do to her when she comes and she breaks the jar of perfume and begins to wash his feet with her hair? What does he do? Does he kick her away? Does he say, away from me? No. What does he do with his mother who says, hey, the, the wedding is out of wine. Can you, you fix it? What does he do? What do we see Jesus do? What do we see the works of Jesus? We see him listen. We see compassion. And we see action. We see him make things right. And so when Jesus is talking to Philip and to Thomas and the other disciples who were gathered around, they walked with him everywhere he went and, and, and yet they didn't quite fully get it. And this is why it's a transformation that you and I have to go through. We don't have the luxury of seeing Jesus with our own eyes every day for a three year stretch of time and begin to, to think through it. We have to read about Jesus and we have to see Jesus in the life of others. And, 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 but it's in Jesus that we see the Father. And it's in Jesus that our understanding of the Father begins to change and we begin to see the Father not as someone who's out to kill and destroy. That's the devil. We see the Father as one who shows compassion and makes things right. We see God the Father as one who cares, not one who's annoyed. And when we begin to see Jesus... And we begin to understand that Jesus, who's described in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when we see that and begin to understand his work and those sort of things, when we look back and we read God in the Old Testament, you know what? We have a transformation of the way we see God there too. How many of you have been mad at God because of all the wars that are mentioned in the Old Testament? How many of you are like, you know what? I, I don't even want to read the Old Testament because that God there had to be a different God. He's not a different God. Jesus is saying, look at me. Look at Jesus to understand God, to understand Father so that you can cry out, in the spirit of adoption, one who was wanted, one who was chosen, Abba, Father. You see, we, that's, we love the fact that Jesus went to the cross and he died for us. He took our place on, on, the, on the cross so that way we didn't have to die. He died for us. We love that about it. But what we forget is, is that that's the Father doing that as well. It's not a separation. The Father is in on that. He's in on choosing you. He's in on giving for you. He's in on rejoicing for you. He's in on making things right for you. It's not just Jesus. Jesus isn't the good guy and the father the bad guy the father loves you immensely he's not just the creator who looks and says oh it's broken Jesus go fix it his heart breaks for you and he wants you to see that he wants you to know that he wants you to experience the fact that he's chosen you, adopted you, accepted you, embracing you so that you can cry out. In real, basic syllable form, Abba, Papa. Dada. That might be how we would say it if it was if Jesus and the rest of them spoke English first instead of Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and all those other things. Do you allow God to continue to transform the way that you understand him? Do you allow God to continue to shape you and transform you so that way 
you have your spirit joining with his spirit crying out, Abba. Or are you in that position of still wondering who is he? If you're still wondering who he is, then go to Jesus. Read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You'll find that you know, some of the stories sound exactly the same, and it's because it's a repeat of the story told by a different writer. But come to see Jesus. Because as he said it well, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. God, as we bow our heads right now, We want to cry out, Father. We want to cry out, Abba, but it's such a loaded phrase for us. It's so hard for us sometimes. And we need your help to transform us. Some of us have been deeply wounded by our dads, and so help us to, to realize that our earthly dads are in some way a reflection of you, but in many aspects, it may be broken and distorted. And so, God, help us to see you through Jesus, to find the forgiveness that you offer to us and offer it to those who've hurt us, those who've given us bad images of you, including 